Hello, this is an interview with the authors of the blip paper. If you haven't seen it, I've made a review video of the paper itself. Be sure to check that out. The authors have seen that and are directly able to respond to it. So we all start on an even footing. It's very cool to have the authors on and this interview particularly was really interesting to me. I hope it is to you. As always, thank you for everyone who leaves a like, who leaves a comment. Uh, thanks to all the Patreons and the support I get on, on Twitter and on YouTube itself. It's really cool and I wish you a lot of fun. Thank you. Hey there, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. Assembly AI is an AI company that offers accurate APIs for speech to text. As a developer, you can use these APIs to automatically transcribe and understand audio and video data in just a few lines of code. Assembly AI automatically converts asynchronous and even live audio streams into text. They have so many features that help you understand your audio data, for example, summarization, content, moderation, topic detection, and much more. Please check them out using the link in the description to let them know I sent you. Now let's get on with the video. Hi everyone, today I'm here with Junnan Li and Dongxu Li, who are two of the researchers of the blip paper. Uh, it's a very big honor to have you here. Welcome both of you. Thanks for Thanks having for us. Really happy to share our work here. Yeah, this, this paper was really cool. I think when it came out, um, everyone saw it and it generated quite a bit of, of buzz um, because it is a new approach to incorporating images and language and it can do a lot of things at the same time. Uh, it is a big system and um, yeah, I was, I was super happy when I saw it. And when I read the paper, I was also pretty pretty happy after I read the paper, which sometimes isn't the case anymore after you read the paper. Uh, yeah. And if you would, if you would just to dive in, maybe if you would pitch your idea to someone, like someone comes to you in a poster session or so, uh, maybe for people who haven't seen the paper review, just extremely briefly, what does your paper say or what do you suppose yeah, sure. or propose? Uh, so maybe I can take this question. Uh, I think uh, the major point of our paper, the selling point, is that uh, we propose a unified framework for visual language pre-training, where we can pre-train this model that has the capability of doing both uh, visual language understanding and uh, visual language generation. So uh, what understanding means that, is that it can jointly understand the two modalities, namely uh, image and text, and produce some kind of multi-model features that can be used, such as for classification tasks. And uh, what uh, generation means here is that it can generate text uh, based on some image input. For example, for image captioning, uh, it's one of a typical generation task. So I think this is the uh, main idea of our, our model. And in terms of the technical, in terms of how do we achieve that, I think there's one big, a uh, point that I would like to highlight is we do have this data set bootstrapping uh, to tackle the challenge of noisy uh, web training data because uh, existing works, a lot of them pre-train on those data that are collected from the image, uh, from the web, which contains the image and all text pairs, which can be noisy. Uh, I think you mentioned in the review video. Uh, so what we do here is that we want to synthetically generate uh, captions and also to use a filter to try to remove the noisy captions. And by doing so, we can uh, significantly improve the quality of the data set. And uh, I think one of the key messages we want to send in the paper is that the quality of the data really matters. Uh, it's as important as if not more important than the quantity. So a lot of past works have focused on scaling up the model with big data. Uh, but here uh, we do scale up, but we also focus on the quality of the data. Um, I want to I wanna dive into this uh, data bootstrapping uh, right away because it is, almost, it is almost a bit of an independent thing from the system itself, right? The, we've long known that you, we can trade off quality for quantity, but usually it is in an exponential fashion. So to get 
the same amount more quality we need exponentially more data if we want to achieve it with uh with less quality data um did you was this was this which came first the idea of building the vision language model or the idea of filtering or the data set because they both play nicely into one another in your paper um and i'm just a bit wondering how did this come to be which came first uh, why why one or the other yeah uh, so actually for my research uh for my past papers i focus uh some papers on this weekly supervised learning or learning from the noisy data so i've always been quite interested in how do people uh, train models with uh, imperfect data which is a very practical scenario and uh, uh, I think this deserve, uh, this field may deserve more attention. It's not as popular as some of the other fields, uh, but it's really a very practical issue and it, it do exist uh, for visual language pre-training. So actually one of my previous paper in visual language pre-training, uh, which we call it LBAF model, uh, it was published in NeurIPS uh, last year. Uh, we have this kind of self-training scheme uh, where we want to clean the noise uh, in the data set, but it's in a relatively uh, more simpler way than what we do here. Uh, so rather than generating synthetic captions, we were doing some self distillation thing. Uh, so then we take it to the next step in the brief paper where we first look at the data set and we see a lot of noise. And here, noise basically means that the caption is not really describing the visual content of the image. It may still be a good uh, human written text, right? It's, it's, it's not the text is grammarly wrong, it's grammarly correct. Uh, it's just that it's not aligned with the image. So what we try to solve is how do we generate uh, text that are more aligned with the image such that our pre-training can benefit uh, from this. I think uh, this this left picture here illustrates it well where it just says from a bridge near my house right uh which is which is a, a weird thing to put in an alt text you would put that usually in some sort of a social media post or so but this is one of the examples where the alt text doesn't really describe the image i thought i thought that was really well were you always aware of this weakness or um like how how do you even find out that that is a large scale problem yeah, so I think uh, I first come uh, find out this problem when going through basically some of the Persian data set. So I think what people previously used uh, a quite standard web data set was this conceptual caption 3 million, uh, which is a relatively medium scale. Uh, it's not too small, but uh, not uh, very huge. And they, are, they do exist a lot of captions like this in that data set. And I found this problem even exaggerates as I try to use a bigger data set, for example, in this paper, we used the Lion, uh, Lion uh, data set, which was a very newly released data set. And uh, the noisy problem was even more, uh, like uh, happens a lot more frequent uh, when you try to scale up the data to include more web images with our text. Uh, so we feel like this is something that if we can solve it, it could really uh, change the, the model's performance. Have you seen that there's a recent paper called something like vision models are more robust and fair when trained on uncurated data or something like this. So uh, yes. this here, you, you seem to say we need better quality data. And that group is saying essentially, no, our models work better when we have less quality, but, but you know, we, we just go out and collect data. Can you maybe establish a bit of a of a connection between the two views? Like, where do they, how do they agree? Mm. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, maybe these are two different aspects. One is the quality and the other is the diversity. So I think what that paper tried to maybe claim is, I, I haven't read the into detail, it's just my, uh, like uh, what my impression was that they try to claim if you have like this huge web data set uh, that is more diverse maybe than your maybe human created data set you can bring better advantage to the model i think that doesn't contradict with what we say here uh, so actually in our experiment we show that the diversity of the captions do matter a lot uh, when we try to generate synthetic captions 
we try to uh, generate a diverse set of captions that covers a whole bunch of different concepts uh, rather than a very common and a safe description of the image. Yeah, I think maybe um, uh, th these two approaches, they se seem to me do not contradict, uh, but uh, complementary to each other. Uh, on one aspect, uh, when you have more data, of course, you can always scale up your, the success of your data set. You end up with having more samples that give you uh, better capacity for the model. But on the other side, with more focus on the quality side, if you really look at the number of images we are using here for the pre-training, compared with some of the other works, it's not a lot. It's not like a, a too much. To to larger scale, but uh, since the quality of our pre-training uh, corpus is better, we end up with a better uh, performance. So I really think the skill and the quality they are complementary and they do not contradict. I believe. Yeah. Um. So let's stay on this on this pre. Uh, sorry, on the on the captioning and filtering for just one more second. Uh, you first did I get this right? You first pre. You first pre-train the entire model on on this uh, uncurated, let's say, data set, and then you use a fine tuning on a human generated captioning data set uh, in order to get these filter and captioning models. Um, is so my worry there would be a little bit exactly what we talked right now. Uh, what my filter and captioning models learn is really dependent on let's say, let's assume the quality of the human generated data set is good, but the diversity of it really matters, right? Because it sort of needs to cover all the images that come, you know, from the uncurated data set. Otherwise, it is going to misjudge, misfilter, or not being able to caption this, this data set. Um, how do you, uh, you know, how do you control for that? And maybe you can also comment on if I now let's say I want to expand my data set to areas that I know that the human one doesn't cover, what could be a method of, you know, still going, still going and, and, and researching on this new type of data? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I think it's a valid concern that this fine tuning may be biased the models to our, to our certain domains. And uh, I think uh, one of the reason we achieve performance improvement is because a lot of these downstream tasks are similar to the cocoa domain image. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's uh, a valid point. But in the meantime, I would say that this fine tuning doesn't destroy the model's capability to generate diverse captions, and uh, because uh, the fine tuning is really a very lightweight procedure. Uh, so for pre-training, we pre-train on this huge data set for two hundred uh, twenty epoch which would take a few days or maybe even a week. But this fine tuning, we only fine tune for five epoch on a very small scale Cocoa data set, which can finish within a few hours. So this fine tuning would not make the model forget about what it has previously saw. Uh, it only slightly modified the model so that it can generate captions that are more like human written ones. But we do find that even after fine tuning, the model can generate captions that are not within the vocabulary of Coco dataset. So it's not like the, the, the fine tuning completely destroyed the model's diversity uh, capability. Uh, so that's uh, your uh, answer to our first question. And for the second question, uh, if someone want to try to uh, expand the model to a different domain uh, where there doesn't exist human annotations, uh, I would say first, if you can collect some, uh, it will be good. Uh, and if you cannot, maybe one solution is there might be some similar images from this huge web data set uh, that maybe you can retrieve. So let's say if you can retrieve some similar images associated with the web captions, uh, then maybe you can slightly fine tune the model on those subset so that the model becomes slightly more biased towards your domain and uh, more suitable to your downstream task. You suggest um, with this drawing, uh, you suggest in with this arrow right here, almost you suggest like a loop. Uh, like 
suggesting that this could be done multiple times, right? I could, uh, uh, you know, go go multiple times through this stage. Is this is this anything? Um, okay, I've I've maybe not seen this in the experiment. If this is anything you've tried, or would would anything change in the loop number two or number three or number four? Like, what would be the difference? I have I've already, you know, there's no new data introduced. Mm. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I would uh, say it's definitely possible to do multiple rounds of iterations of this bootstrapping. And in our future work, we mentioned this as one of the future work. Uh, and in terms of extra knowledge, like each round of bootstrapping, we can add in new captions, right? So if the model becomes better, it can generate better synthetic captions. And there, there might be a diminishing return if we do multiple rounds. Uh, I would su say my intuition is the first round will probably help the most, and maybe the second, the third will help less. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the time and computation constraint, we didn't really uh, have the resource to uh, produce the experiment before the paper. Uh, so that's definitely one of the future plans uh, that we have. Uh, yeah. Um, so let's shift maybe, sorry. Good. Um, okay. Uh, you, this model here is quite big. Uh, that's was my first impression when I saw it. There's a lot of stuff. Okay. I have also drawn a lot of stuff on it. I'm sorry. I can make this go away. Um, so the model here is relatively big and relatively, you know, there's, there's modules going around, there's parameter sharing going on. Uh, what was the, what was the evolution of this model? Was this, is this version one that we're looking at right here? Or is this like, you know, version 50 after you've tried a bunch of other things? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely not version one. So actually this model is heavily like inspired by our previous uh, LBAF model, uh, which is a encoder only model. So if you look at the model, there's not too much difference between LBAF and Blip, except the fact that now we add the uh, generation capability to Blip with the language modeling loss. Uh, so the, the reason why we want to add this is first that uh, because the encoder models doesn't really transfer that well to image captioning task and other generation tasks. So it's better that we can pre-train it to have this capability. Uh, that's why we add in this new decoder module. Uh, and uh, uh, then after we add in the decoder module, we thought, uh, since we are doing multitask learning, can we share some parameters? Uh, because uh, first of all, it's more efficient to share parameters. And secondly, uh, it may bring some advantage from the multitask training. Uh, by jointly optimizing uh, those uh, few losses. So we tried different sharing strategy. strategy. Uh, first, we start with not sharing any parameters at all. And then we try to share maybe the, uh, so we try to decouple maybe some uh, the cross attention layer or the self attention layer or the FIFO layer. Uh, then we find that the decoupling the self attention layer from the encoder and decoder is a more efficient and uh, effective way. So. That's why we choose this uh, strategy. But uh, there is a possibility that uh, because we are doing this experiment on a relatively smaller scale uh, pre-training, so we were using the 40 million images uh, for pre-training, but our final model was pre-trained on 100 million images. So maybe this sharing strategy is not the optimal for uh, if you scale up the data set. So I would imagine if you want to have the best possible uh, performance, you may want to scale up the data set and try to decouple the parameters more. But that would, of course, sacrifice some of the efficiencies uh, bring by the parameter sharing. Yeah, uh, another, yeah. Another point I probably want to add here is like um, um, this architecture is not like um, ad hoc design because remember that one of our starting point is to eliminate the noise, uh, noise levels in this pre-training data sets. So from, from there, uh, we, uh, on one side, we need to identify uh, what are the noisy ones, right? whether the image and the caption, they match with each other. And that end up with this design of encoder model. 
Uh, on the other side, we want even more that when we find that uh, the, the caption does not align well with the image itself, we don't want to simply discard the training data point. We want to generate some useful captions, surprising captions that can further help us. So from, from that, I really want to say that uh, it's not like we want to put everything together, glue different uh, models into a single model to make it big. It really serves very well uh, for this caption filter algorithm. Yeah, and I think that kind of, yeah, uh, yeah, just one additional comment is that our model is really actually not big uh, if you compare it to some other models. So uh, uh, basically, our model is a VIT plus a, a, a bird. So uh, it's a base version of the bird. So in terms of the number of parameters, I would say it's a standard uh, parameter deep learning model. Uh, it's not that crazy huge. Uh, so even we draw it uh, in the current figure, Actually, there is because of this parameter sharing going on, uh, the number of parameters and the training uh, uh, computation load is not that heavy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I like the fact that uh, this really arises from sort of the goal of cleaning the data set. It plays, I, f I also thought the more I read it and the more I talked about it, it became more evident that the things really played together nicely. You use uh, the you use the, the contrastive loss to get the hard negatives for the for the uh, for the I, I want to say like matching matching loss or rancor loss and then that gives you the filter and then the the language model here gives you the captioning um, with respect to parameter sharing um, you said okay the the matching head or the contrastive heads, they're not really good at captioning themselves. So we'd rather pre-train or train a captioning or a language generation model. Do you find that adding the task of language generation also helps the tasks that the other models would be good at? Um, like, do you find an additional benefit except for our model can also do captioning? Do you find an additional benefit for the already existing or the already tackled tasks by adding, let's say, the language model? Yes, yes. We find that uh, there's an advantage bring, bring, uh, brought by this language model loss. Uh, so this language model loss, if you think about it, is really quite similar to the mass language model loss, except that now it's an autoregressive version. Right? So in our previous LBAF work and in some other papers, what people usually do is this mass language modeling. Uh, to try to improve the uh, model's capability to, to understand the text uh, in a more fine-grained granularity because the image text matching and image text contrastive learning is more like a global uh, matching, right? You are trying to match the image and text, but the language model is more fine-grained. You want to generate the word based on the image, and by uh, achieving so, you need to better understand maybe some details of the image and align it with the textual concept to be able to generate the word. Um, do you do you have, let's say, more more extensive goals in mind here? Uh, you just said it's actually not that big, you know, it fits really nicely. I agree with all of that. Yet I foresee a future where you could, you know, bring together lots of these modules. Uh, essentially, what I what I'd like to have is, um, first of all, we could obviously think of doing the same with the image side right here. You just have an encoder here right now, um, but we could think of you know breaking out here, doing image generation, doing um, you know what whatever we can do with images. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe an even bigger future vision would be: uh, I bring a data set and I say, look, these are pairs of images and text. Now, please system, make me a model that includes all of these losses that I can think of, like all of these different combinations and the system would figure out, oh, okay, I can share, you know, I can share parameters here and I can build that and so on. And um, maybe that would, given your findings, which I, you know, I totally believe that adding more of these tasks and sharing the parameters actually mutually benefits uh, each other, the representations, they become more capable, they become uh, maybe more more broadly meaningful and so on. So I think 
that might be a cool a cool future to to work uh, against i don't know how feasible it is though <laughs> is that anything on your roadmap or uh you know what does the future look like of these models yeah i think that's a very cool idea uh maybe a very ambitious goal uh so we have considered to add in some image generation capability but uh we didn't because it uh doesn't fit very well with our current framework. So we don't want to make the framework to be very huge uh, and messy. We try to keep it more cleaner. Uh, uh, but regarding your point that can we have automatic system that can maybe combine different modules and losses, uh, I think that's a possible goal. Uh, it's just there could be a lot of obstacles in how to achieve that. Uh, for example, if we borrow some idea from the NAS community and maybe we borrow some reinforcement learning idea, uh, maybe there are some ways we can train a policy to do that. Uh, but it's not entirely clear to me how, how can we achieve that? Because I think the main problem is this pre-training is uh, how to evaluate a pre-training is a big problem, right? So uh, you cannot just say that uh, a lower pretrainial loss means that your model is better downstream task. Uh, if 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 there's uh if there is a correlation between pretrainial loss and downstream task, uh, then it may be easier, right? You just find the optimal module that you can minimize your pretrainial loss. But usually it's not the case. It also depends on how well aligned is your pretrainial task and your downstream task. Uh, so I think that's one of the major issues of why it may take some trial and error to find the, the best strategy uh, for the pre-training. Yeah, may, maybe I can add a few sentences to, to that. Um, I think ha ha being able to figure out how to, uh, you know, combine these different modules together automatically would be super cool and uh, futuristic. <laughs> uh, yet, I think there are a couple of practical messages that we want to convey here uh, which is a, a the first I think if you re really look at how this uh, we we fine tune we fine tune this MBD model to make them a, a, a captioner a filter and also how we combine these different modules together in order to tackle the down, uh, downstream tasks there are really some dedicated ways to do that and usually if you look at uh, uh, some uh, pre-training works on the market their strategies will be pretty uh, simplistic in the sense that in most of occasions they just add the task specific heads but in this uh, particular work we uh, just move one step further than that we uh, rethinking how to rearrange these modules and what are the best strategies uh, for this parameter sharing strategy um i, I hope uh, another uh, me message we, we we may want to say here is a lot of people they blindly do this multitasking by aggregating hundreds of different data sets and tasks into one pre-training model and maybe uh, from uh, from maybe uh, by bleep we uh, want people to kind of revi revisit this decision next time we do this they do this multitasking because not necessarily every task they complement with each other and you may want to carefully look into what to share what not to share i think these are the two uh, things we want to uh, remind uh, for, uh, yeah for future works yeah, and I have one uh, additional comment to follow what Dongxu said is that uh, you can see a lot of other works, they really combine a really like maybe eight or 10 objectives together, right? So there are some uh, strategies for vision language training is you bring in the object detection objective to improve your localization capability. Uh, so we think that's a, a way to, that's a valid way to improve performance, but here, what we try to say is that we want to keep things very nice and simple, right? So we have these three laws where each law serves a very clear purpose uh, and can be transferred to a very specific downstream task. And all we need is just image text pairs. We don't need any bounding box or anything else. Uh, so I think that's what, one of the message we want to also convey. Cool. And yeah, and, and I, I especially, 
I like the fact that with pre-training, with the aspect of fine tuning, then you're able to recombine these different modules in, in very creative ways. So even, even though you have these modules, they have their purposes for the pre-training, for the captioning, for the filtering, but then they can be, it seems, it seems, uh, many, many tasks can now be tackled by some sort of combination of these models and a little bit of fine tuning, which is something that I find uh, really cool. Um, you have done extensive and like, uh, there are, there are lots of, lots of tables mean, means you had to run like and collect lots of numbers, um, which is, is very nice because gives a bit also of a broad overview than just having, you know, four numbers or so comparing with one baseline. Um, although could you uh, maybe highlight some of the, of the standing out results that you got or one of some of the more important results, like how would you summarize or what would you highlight about your experimental evaluation of this? Yeah, sure. I think the most important one would be table one, uh, where we demonstrate the, uh, performance gain achieved by how do we bootstrap our data set. Yeah. And yeah, so this is table. Basically, if you look at the first column, it shows uh, how many images we are using. So we have two settings. One is a 40 million images. Uh, another we scale up with small noisy, uh, image text pairs. And the second column is how do we perform the bootstrapping? Uh, C stands for captioning and F stands for filtering. It means whether we do captioning to generate synthetic one, uh, captions, or we do filtering to remove the noisy captions, or we do both together. Uh, so if you look at the first row, second row, third, and the fourth row, you can see that uh, both the captioning and the filtering can help uh, individually. And if you combine them together, they, they really have complement each other, right? So by generating synthetic captions and at the same time try to remove the noise, uh, we can achieve, I would say, a quite good amount of uh, gain in these two different, uh, four different uh, data sets covering both the retrieval task and the, the captioning task. So I think that's one of the key uh, results we have here. And also maybe then it goes to the uh, second table is how do we do the uh, bootstrapping of the captions, right? So do we use beam search or do we use nuclear sampling? So the difference between those two approaches is that beam search is a deterministic uh, sampling, uh, not sampling, deterministic decoding strategy where you try to find the most likely sentence uh, associated with the image. And nuclear sampling is a stochastic approach where you try to sample according to some uh, probability distribution, right? Uh, and we find that surprisingly, uh, if you compare beam search with no uh, generation, there is a good gain uh, achieved by beam search. But by moving beam search to nuclear sampling, there is a similar amount of gain. So this is something that we didn't expect at the first time we see the results. And after we really deep, uh, deep dive into what the captions look like, uh, how uh, how does beam search and nuclear sampling generate different captions? We found out that uh, the beam search will generate a kind of a safe caption that accurately describes the image most of the time, but it's not surprising. So you can commonly see those uh, uh, the, these captions in the data set. Uh, and that doesn't add a lot of extra knowledge for the model to learn, but the nuclear sampling really introduced some really diverse captions uh, that are more like human written ones, right? The human don't write uh, a very boring distribution like a man is uh, with a dog in a park, right? So it's a very boring question, uh, boring caption, but nuclear sampling can give you more diverse captions. And uh, if you look at the noise ratio, which is actually how much of those captions were filtered out by our filter, you can also see that beam search is less noisy. Uh, but even though it's less noisy, it, it's not as beneficial as nuclear sampling here. And this really raises another question, which, which I think is a very interesting future work, is that is nuclear sampling the best way, right? So because those models are pre-trained with the language modeling 
uh, loss, which is kind of a deterministic loss. You try to maximize the likelihood uh, of your captions. Uh, and uh, uh, we are just doing that, and we try to do something in the decoding side to try to give more diverse captions. Uh, but this nuclear sampling was used in mostly NLP uh, papers. So is, does there exist some better diverse captioning strategy uh, for image captioning task? So I think that's a very interesting uh, question. I think in, in recent times, this has been shining through in a lot of works uh, that the fact that maybe we don't need to go maximum likelihood in, in, our, in our inference step, but maybe it's a better approach to do go diverse with the sampling and then exactly what you do, have some sort of a classifier or some sort of a filter uh, to, just, to just scrap out the noise. I think that's a really, really good approach. And we saw this you know, anywhere. I think Dolly famously uh, had, had clip re-ranking all the outputs. And I think more and more models go towards this. It's really cool, really cool finding um, that you're essentially, you're finding exactly the same thing. Uh, when I look at these numbers, um, all of the numbers, it's, it's very, let's say, it's very convincing to see that everything uniformly, almost, almost uniformly gets better, right? Um, you know, you're, you support whatever you say really well. I mean, this, this trend right here, it's, it, it really works across, let's say, across all of the data sets, you uniformly almost get better, um, in all the tables, <laughs> uh, However, the difference is always, you know, there is the maximum difference is whatever this, this from here to here is like two points in, uh, what, what is this? What's TR? It's the true. Uh, it's a, re a recall, text recall. Re oh, text, re text recall. Sorry. Oh yeah. It's down here. Okay. Uh, text recall, image recall. Um, that's like 2%, right here again, it's like one point something percent. So there's a uniformly getting better. Uh, my question is, given that the getting better is convincing, but the scale of it is like, yeah, 2% or so, uh, when is it worth to do this weeks long or week long pre-training you mentioned, right? This is a big procedure. The pre-training is big and then you fine tuning and pre-training again. Um, when is it worth it? from what scale or for what applications does it become actually worth to do something like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And uh, uh, first of all, I would say it is worth doing if your data is really, uh, if you observe a large amount of noise in the data and uh, maybe your data is incomplete in some of the domains. For example, here, uh, the web data is primarily dominated by those uh, all text, which can be different from what human would write to describe an image. Right? So there, if there is a noisy scenario or a domain gap, I think it's worth to do so. Uh, and secondly, actually, we have also released our uh, data set after bootstrapping, so that if you are just trying to do vision only pertraining in a similar domain, uh, I think uh, you can just download our version and uh, use that as a starting point to avoid the first round of pre-training. Uh, and maybe certainly uh, about your previous comment that uh, we have a really unanimous improvement for those tasks. Uh, actually, in one of the tasks, uh, maybe you can scroll down the paper. Uh, let me try to find. Uh, I think it's what the NLVR task. Uh, Table eight, maybe. Yeah, yeah, table eight. Yeah, actually, for this task, right, this is where we find the better quality of captions uh, doesn't necessarily give you a better gain uh, if you compare uh, here. Uh, and actually, by scaling up the number of pre-trained image, it, it doesn't correlate uh, very straightforwardly to a downstream performance gain. Uh, so I think it still depends on your alignment between your pre-training and your uh, downstream objective. So for most of tasks, it is well aligned, and that's why improving your pre-training data quality can improve your downstream task. 
Yeah, um, maybe I can add a few sentences to uh, in terms of whether it is worthwhile to improve that much. I think if you really imagine the big picture here uh, in terms of the multimodal retrieval, uh, let's say uh, if you uh, deploy this retrieval algorithm and that managed to improve their profit by 1%, that's a huge achievement and uh, you won a lot. So uh, at Salesforce, we also have uh, the retrieval. Uh, we have we also uh, work with clients for their uh, retrieval uh, services. So in terms of that, uh, if you just let your GPU run for one week and improve by one person, that's a huge improvement, I would say, <laughs> right? And uh, I would also uh, like to say that these numbers they uh, kind of uh, um, I think uh, um, under have uh, what Bleep has achieved, because uh, I think Bleep beyond this uh, um, relative advantage uh, over its competitors, it's also qualitatively better in terms of in terms in terms of how easy uh, it is to use Bleep. If you re really look at the uh, demo we created there on the web, whole host on the web. And uh, it just freely ask uh, any questions in natural language uh, rather easily. Uh, in contrast, a lot of these image question answering uh, models, they are kind of, they are not doing the free form generation, right? They kind of doing classification in order to tackle this question answering uh, task. Uh, this point is, however, not fully demonstrated, uh, in, I, I believe, um, in, in the current manuscript. So uh, if you really want to uh, get impressed, uh, we really suggest you uh, check out our demo and uh, put whatever photos you like and questions. Cool. Uh, it's really neat, by the way, that you have like a, an, a demo to go along with it, uh, because I think it, it, makes, it makes it more accessible and uh, it demonstrates also the the capabilities of this. It's almost like we're moving into it. It's it's we're moving into the world that GPT three maybe has created for text uh, with these image language models. Uh, because you know we got the same feeling from GPT three. Oh no, you can I can just go and I can put any text right, and I can interact with the system in a sort of a free form way. And uh, it's really cool to see that we're also moving in this direction with with the image models um, in, in terms of, in terms of just the, the process of how this is research went about it, you ended up with a cool system with a nice way of bootstrapping data and so on uh, was there. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about stuff that didn't necessarily work out during the research? Was there any point where you were uh, maybe disheartened a little bit, things that didn't work out? Uh, what were your low and your high points? during this, the, the creation of this paper? Yeah, uh, actually one of the, like the uh, experiment we had was when we first tried to scale up the pre-training with more web images uh, using this line data set that we have downloaded, uh, which takes quite uh, some time. Uh, it doesn't help that much. Uh, so then uh, it feels really feel like uh, why scaling up the data is not benefiting the model. So then I did some more analysis. And after uh, that, I realized that a lot of those uh, images are very, very small in the resolution. Some are just icons or some brand names. Uh, and if I remove those, then it begins to show the, the gains. But I, I think that, that's one of the kind of the blockers uh, we faced. Uh, and I think after we first get the bootstrapping, especially the nuclear sampling, uh, to give a big uh, performance gain, then at that point, we are quite confident that uh, this should be a good uh, solution. And uh, I think that that point is when I realized, OK, uh, this method uh, should work well, and we can write a paper about it. Go ahead, Dong. Did you want to say something? 
Yeah, I, I believe some of these uh, strategies they also arise from the discussion, internal discussions with other group members at Salesforce. So it's really a lot of uh, uh, crowd intelligence behind the scenes. So yeah, that's how is how is research uh, organized at, at Salesforce? Like I have a bit of insight into you know the let's say the 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 big tech giants like Google and Facebook and so on, and they they have. They have their research divisions uh, at a company like Salesforce, who who is more uh, customer. I want to say customer. Or, all these companies are customer oriented, obviously. <laughs> but um, how how is how is research organized there? Like, what do you do while the model is pre training for a week? Like, do you have do you have other stuff to do, or are you mainly researchers, or what's life like there? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I would say that AI is a big part of Salesforce. Uh, what they try to achieve, like to use AI to better help the customers. So we have this separate uh, research division, uh, maybe not as large as Google or Facebook, uh, but I think everything works quite quite well in our research team. Uh, in terms of our day-to-day -day operation, uh, I think it's mostly similar to other industrial researchers. We uh, we can uh, quite flexible to do uh, research or do some more product oriented uh, work, uh, and uh, like we are uh, motivated to do research that can generate high impact, uh, that can really change the field uh, in a more substantial way. And uh, when we wait for the GPU uh, to finish training, you already we just do other research stuff or. Uh, read some papers involved in some uh, internal discussions, or maybe try to solve some uh, uh, real production problems. Cool. Um, is there anything else you want to get out about this paper? Uh, you already said people can go to to the web uh, to your repo, and you have a you have a demo also available. Uh, is there anything you'd want to get out? Like how can how how is what's the easiest for people to get started uh, with this research? Yes, so I think uh, first, uh, again, welcome to try out our demo and uh, welcome to visit our GitHub. Uh, we do have, uh, I think, quite detailed instructions on how to download and pre-train or fine-tune the model. Uh, and also, I welcome uh, any suggestions or questions you might have uh, about our uh, model that uh, we can use that to improve uh, our uh, model uh, or the code. Uh, that would be great. Cool. Dongxu, anything, any last messages? Yeah, our team is expanding. So if you are interested, <laughs> just let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we Excellent. are looking for an uh, intern position in the vision language research. Cool. Who can apply? Anyone that is at university or? Yeah, yeah, anyone can apply. We hire globally so we can do remote working now. Cool. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Dongxi and Jinan, thank you very much for being here. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. Really appreciate it.